Thank you, uh, Luis. I'm very happy to be here today. So, I will pack an agenda for you. So, let me start uh, very quickly. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to be talking about reshoring uh, poetry. So, you can see that uh, you know, we've had a cosy pandemic. We've had a, a lot of issues that have uh, due to the pandemic, uh, as you all know. We thought we were coming out of that pandemic, and suddenly we saw the war in Ukraine, which is affecting uh, the supply chain very significantly. And now, if you uh, read the statement from uh, KPMG here, you see inflation driven by supply chain is unlikely to ease in 2023 due to many force uh, factors, surging commodity prices associated with Russia, uh, Russia and Ukraine war, a rising threat uh, ship, uh, shipping uh, business will need to consider mitigating strategies such as onshoring and nearshoring production. So this is all good, but how do we do that? This is what we're going to be covering during my presentation. So if you look at traditional manufacturing uh, today, we actually have a very centralized uh, production, basically a facility which can be in the UK, sometimes very far in Asia, for instance in China. That means that you have a very long lead time for your product. And that can be a real bottleneck uh, and, and a real issue. Today we see the price of uh, container shipment going up and really being extremely high, which should also have an impact on inflation, as we all know we are facing right now in the UK. But with additive manufacturing, we are able actually to reshore and locate the production near your customer. You can actually also move to a digital inventory, meaning that you don't necessarily have to store spare parts in the warehouse. You can actually have a digital inventory, meaning the CAT file can be stored, for instance, on the PLM software and be printed on demand when needed by your customer. This is really, really agile. You can also significantly reduce your lead time. I will show you an example comparing injection molding lead time versus additive manufacturing lead time. And you will see the reduction is very, very significant. But first, let me show you uh, a bit more about strategies. So, if you are familiar with our product, and I'm sure many of you do, you know that we started with FDM 30 years ago. So, strategies, Scott Crump in the US, in Minneapolis, invented the FDM technology, or fused deposition modeling technology, which is basically one of the first technology invented related to scalability. We then acquired and merged uh, with a company with Polyjet. And more recently, we invested into additional technology like stereotography with a UK-based company called RPS that we acquired. Origin history, which actually come from the US, from uh, San Francisco. And more lately, SAP. SAP, Selective Absorption Fusion, with a technology uh, developed by Neil Hopkinson from uh, the University of, um, uh, of Long Brown. And it basically patented this technology. And then he's been now uh, working for us as a CTO and is further developing and enhancing the technology. But how do each technology work? Those technologies actually cover different aspects of the product life cycle, from the design to the production. As you can see on this slide here, you have the JT technology, which typically are better suited for design or engineering or functional parts. And then as we move towards manufacturing aids or production parts, we have the ADN, the P3 technology, the AP technology, and the SAP technology. The SAP and P3 can be really good solution for parts in the thousands or even in the tens of thousands. And I will show you actually cost comparison in a minute which will compare how um, SAP and is comparing with uh, injection volume. Today I'm going to cover two and focus on two examples on two of those technologies, FDM and SAP technology. So my first question is, does Stratasys aim solution provide a cost benefit versus injection only? And if yes, which technology is the best suited for that? And the answer is actually yes. We have actually done extensive study looking at different geometry and also the part complexity and the size of the part do matter when it comes to uh, achieving a certain volume and uh, break-even versus injection only. One of the key issues is injection molding in the lead time. Typically 12 weeks, right now, mainly probably more than like 20 weeks to get an injection mold done in Asia, for instance, and start production. So during that time frame, we are not able to produce any parts. With SAP technology, we can actually start producing the next day. Within 24 hours, you can have the first part that you can start and ship to your end customer. 
So you can see here we have three examples of parts. The top one being the most complex, but also it's a fairly small part, meaning you can nest a very high number within the big volume of the SAP printer. You can actually have a look on the left hand side, you have a, the printer on display. And you can see the cost here for injection molding. To make 10,000 of those parts, the cost of each individual part is $9 for this screen. Using SAP, we are actually $0.38, 96% cost saving. The break even point versus injection molding in this case is 242,800 parts. Now, if you find a part which is less complex, meaning that the cost of the injection mold is going to be lower, we find that the part in the middle has a cost for injection molding of $1.72 versus the south cost of $0.65. Cents. That's a 62% cost reduction. And the break even point here is 26,400 parts. And we look at the final example here, where actually we cannot reach 10,000 parts. The part is simpler, the mold is cheaper, and the material being consumed is higher. We start with a direct link to the cost of the part with the material being used. With the injection molding, the cost of the mold has a much bigger impact on the cost than the material. So in this case, you can see for southern parts, the last example we had $22.64, versus south at $7.96, which is 65% saving when you talk about the volume of the southern parts. The break even in this case is 4,372 parts. So we can still win, but you see, to a lower level of parts. That means that not all parts will be suitable to be replaced with uh, the SAP technology. But however, we find that for products which are in the thousands to the tens of thousands, there is multiple applications which can be really suitable for this technology. And let's not forget, as I mentioned earlier, we are actually starting to print within two to three days. We will have a part versus 12 weeks minimum to get the part from the world. We actually have applied this process on the printer itself. So within the SAF H350 printer, there are about 30 uh, PA11 parts which are actually 3D printed. We also had our own product with uh, some electronic circuits uh, from the supply chain. And we were able to actually find an alternative solution which worked perfectly, but it needed to be cool. So we had to fit a fan on top of the electronic board, and you can see here the bracket which was designed by our engineer and then printed with the printer. Very cost effective and rapid solution to solve a supply chain issue here. And again, when we look at the cost per part here, we are looking in this case at the southern parts. We can see the vacuum power extraction lead, we have a 42% cost saving, and a break even at the southern 725 parts. For the Z speed up, where we actually can nest a significantly higher number, in one minute we can print over 2,300 of those parts in a single <coughs> job within 12 hours. And that's 98 percent saving, and the pregnant is 58,200 parts. The housing, typical for electronic housing, here the pregnant point is 1,670 parts. But you can see here we have a very good success stories already. And this is an example from one of our customers in Germany called Guts Machine Go. They actually had one of their customers, a wood milling machine from Germany, who had one of their housing stuck on a container on the Swiss Canal. The ever given ship, you may remember, was stuck for a few weeks in the Swiss Canal, and they actually had one of those parts being stuck in, the, in this uh, container. And they were actually able to print 80 of those covers very successfully in a record time and sold the product, meaning that this customer was able to ship their wood milling machine to the end customer without any problem. Another great example here is actually a conveyor belt. And you can see here that before it was damaged, and after, the video is going to show you the part which are actually in that gray, in the right hand corner of the video, working perfectly as a replacement. All the dark on the right hand side, the dark patches are printed parts. And the numbers speak for themselves. Replacing the conveyor belt would have costed $10,000. They were able to print 75 replacement parts at $3.10 each. And the selling was $9,760. Significant saving here. And a real life example of a customer who had a problem of spare parts. Now let's look at another example. This is actually a company who makes a low volume uh, waste resin uh, printing machine. So it's a, a post curing of waste resin, uh, typically serving uh, the 3D printing industry. 
But what they had to do is develop the product in a record time and only had a market of probably 50 to 100 products a year. So not a huge amount. They were thinking of using uh, injection molding initially for, to make many of their parts. They calculated over a million dollars worth of mold to basically produce their product. But at the end, they decided to use staff from prototype to functional testing to a new spot. And as you can see here, are some of the components within the big volume of the printer, you, they are able to print 92 components within 12 hours, which means a weekly production of 1,288 uh, parts. They can actually make 28 of their wrap machine per week. This is actually replacing the traditional manufacturing with this solution. And here are some examples of those applications of staff within the product. The uh, VAT receptacle is actually printed with P11 and then dyed in black. You can see this we characterize the resistance. Then we have the core rotating guide, which need to have some mechanic load bearing capability. And then you have the display bezel, which is also finished to a high standard. And you cannot distinguish the part that the quantity is an injection loading part. And then finally, the light shroud mount, which are P11, ductile, and other high stands. So really good example of how customers are today using this technology to solve their supply chain issues. And then we are now looking at the second question. What technology offers the widest range for tuning application? And as you can see here, actually FDM typically is the most best supplier. And why FDM? Because it's simple to use. It's simple to integrate on the factory flow. It has a wide range of material and it's very easy to implement uh, as a solution. From jigs, to fixtures, to tooling, but even some unused parts and some spare parts as well. Typically FDM will work for very lower volume in the hundreds of parts and for larger parts as where FDM is, uh, is very well placed. Let's look here at some examples of jigs and fixtures. We have metal forming, where actually some nylon 12 carbon fiber tools are replacing metal forming tools on the factory floor. We are not talking about hundreds of thousands of parts here, but these two can be used, for instance, for 500 parts, where you need to form aluminum or steel sheet of metal, and this is proven to work within the accuracy required. Drill guides, Welding fixtures, which actually is quite surprising because we are taking thermoplastic and you have the heat, but actually it works fantastically well. Test fixtures, sound testing, CNC jewels, assembly jigs, and protective covers. Let me show you first of all our LDN portfolio, and then I will show you a couple of examples of those uh, applications. So, first of all, you may know our LDN portfolio. We have the starting from the F123 series, so we have the F170, F190 CR, but really the, the one which are more suitable for the g feature are the F370 CR, which is a new product, which has a new uh, carbon field nylon CF10, 10% carbon field nylon material, fantastic mechanical properties. But if you want to go to the next level up in terms of replacing aluminium parts, the nylon 12 CF is 35% job carbon fiber is really the best material we have to offer on the Fortisco 50. In addition, on the Fortisco 50, we've now opened the system, meaning we have a software, as Andrea mentioned in his presentation, which enables you to be able to tune the parameters and bring any third party material on the Fortisco 50. In addition, we are also bringing validated materials which are doubling the number of materials on the platform from 14 to 28, that's a significant number of material. But let's hear it also from our customer. So AFS, or Additive Life Science, based in Singapore, here uses extensively the Fortis 50 for production parts. They actually make aerospace and use parts in U10985, which are certified by a company like Airbus and Boeing. And as you can see here, their scrap rate is below 0.5%. At the end of the day, there's cheaper system on the market, but if you have to scrap 50% of your part in products, or your parts are not meeting the mechanical requirements, it's actually the return on investment is going to be worse than on the Fortis 50. The install base of this system is over 2,000 printers worldwide. It's a proven system which works time and time again. Looking at the OpenNM software, so I talked to you that now the system is fully open. That's a really big novelty here. And as you can see here, now we have a new software, which is a look and feel of GrabCAD, and enable you to 
between parameters, like for instance, the flow of material being extruded, the temperature of the extrusion head, all those materials can be tuned. And you can actually uh, bring some part of material. What is unique is not the software, it's a combination of the software with the hardware. This is based on the photoscopic team. As I told you, we have better results than the competitors. We have a very low coefficient of variation, below 5.5% based on the free material we have tested, Rutem, ASA, and Alentrophon Fiber, and a proven yield above 93%, meaning that parts time and time again will be acceptable to your and your customers. Now, this slide is talking about third party material. So, none of those materials on this slide are today sold by Spatis. But with OpenAM, now we can unleash the full potential of your Fortis 450 and bring, for instance, text and film material for EMI shielding. We can bring big material, which are typically very difficult to extrude. But this is now visible with the OpenAM. Or PETG, or PET material, for instance, for full packaging or graphic fit material for their conductivity can also be uh, used on our canisters and in our printers. For where is the trigger damage? All those are now open, and this is really just to give you some ideas, but the potential is really unlimited. This is a, the beauty of an open system. Now let's look at what strategies we have been tuning. Those materials you can see here are validated by statistics, meaning we spent about 18 months working on tuning parameters to enable you to make successful prints time and time again. We have been working with Codestro, where we have launched a PS666 with 20% glass fiber, which is actually fire uh, retardant, so it's a low-scope fire retardant material which is certified for instance for the red industry. We have a new fire retardant polycarbonate from Kenya, which is used for instance, by a company like Alstom today. Also, we trace in combat. This is a very interesting material because it's a big based material. It's a slight blend which enables you to print large parts because printing big today with large parts is very, very challenging and you don't really see many successes out there. So, this is really a solution which works but also as a solid support. So, it can be also an alternative to customer using U10 5 and we really want to have a solid support for an FST material, fire, smoke, and toxicity rating material. We are also launching the HIPS material, which is a high impact polystyrene material, uh, which is a, a very nice uh, prototyping material. In addition, we are launching several colors on the OT9085. Why colors? Because if you are an aerospace customer, you want to eliminate the post processing. If you can print a white, a gray, or a red part, and you can actually directly put that into your aircraft without having to paint it, you can save about 25% of the cost per part. This is a significant cost benefit for people who are making production with the technology. In addition, we are using PC black, red, and PC ABS in red as well. So let's have a look on digital features. Here, we are actually comparing the different carbon film material, even with one of our competitors who have a 9 and 10 percent carbon fiber. And then we, when you compare the nylon uh, uh, with 10% carbon fiber from the earth with the nylon CF10, you can see that we are significantly better. Actually, the competitor is closer to our ABS CF10, which is a 10% carbon feed ABS. Now, if you look at the nylon uh, uh, 12CF, which is uh, the, the darker bar uh, on the chart, you see you have the best mechanical properties. And this is why, time and time again, our customer purchase the Fortis 450 to replace metal parts and metal tube on the factory floor. But also sometimes some of our customers are telling us, yes, but we heard about continuous fiber from you know, other vendors. Continuous fiber is really, really good when you do tensile testing. And it's true, it works. But what about bending? What about torsion? Here we have a real life example for the RNA line. We actually are using tubes which today uh, are made of aluminium, and we're looking at replacing them with 3D printed uh, tubes instead. We created a bench here where we clamped one of the uh, lever that is used by the RNLI, and then we loaded it with weight. We also had parts printed from the computer with the maximum number of continuous fiber in the part. And those are the results. We compared two geometry, a solid geometry and an optimized geometry, as you can see in the one on the right hand side. And as you can see in terms of deflection, you see the higher the curve, the more deflection, meaning that you are further away from the aluminium 
to not the least deflection possible. And stratasys for both design is actually outperforming the continuous fiber. And the reason is when you take a cross section of these two, you have 35% carbon fiber. While our competitors, despite using continuous fiber, have a mixture of sandwich structure, which means they have a material, base material with only 10% carbon fiber and the rest being continuous fiber. Overall, they have less carbon fiber per cross section, meaning their parts are deflecting more. We are actually outperforming continuous fiber with 95 carbon fiber. But it's not just about that, it's about the print time. The print time is significantly faster as well. Here we're talking about a couple of hours for our system, that's 12 hours. So 2 hours 55 in our case, that's 12 hours 46 for the competition. Why do we win? Because we have a much higher nesting density. This density of the part is about 99%, 35% carbon fiber. Also due to our oven, we use in the process of it, we have a good layer-to-layer -layer addition, which gives a good isotropic properties. Being an iron material, it also has a good impact resistance. And in terms of the stiffness compared to continuous fiber, we find that we have 50% stiffer part, three times cheaper and four times faster. One of our automotive customers, who is actually doing a lot of work with non carbon fiber, has a payback for their F900, which is a large FDM system of 14 months. Now, let me show you some examples of those customers, what they are doing with their system. Because it's all good to say, yes, theoretically, you can say it's that much. This is General Motors in North America. It's actually one of our largest customers in terms of uh, FDM system for tooling application. You can see at the bottom the conveyor overhead riser, which are actually uh, made of aluminium. At the top, it's quite difficult to see, but actually you can see some lattice structure which are printed in 912 carbon fiber and replacing the aluminium parts. There's a significant benefit in terms of waste, lead time for them, and that's really solving their issue because any downtime on the production line because they don't have those parts will cost them a fortune. And this is really one of the key applications at General Motors in North America. Now we have other industry using also the Fortress 450 and next I have a video of one of the customers showing that. One of the great things that's clear from that. Really personal piece of equipment like the Travis is working with always new things to go try. We had a challenge a couple months ago where we were going to make a sheet metal part come to find out very close to the the tooling had been damaged and was no longer usable and all of a sudden we had to figure out how we're going to make this part. My engineer sat down with the sheet metal fabricator and in a couple of days with one iteration we printed a full size forming tool out of 912 CF. There's a lot of bets going on, I think, of whether it's going to work or not, but it worked fantastically the first time. It allowed us to save a significant amount of time and we did it very economically. It was a short run job, so instead of spending a lot of money machining tool steel and a very complex geometry, we can print it and have the parts in a couple of days. The best thing about added manufacturing is part complexity does not affect either time or cost, which is a huge savings to us because it allows us to think really broadly about how we're going to approach the design. I think it's always good to see the real application here in this case, you know, metal forming. Here we have another example uh, at the top uh, of a case study where we have a forming tonnage of 6 tons. Uh, the material is aluminium 6061. The uh, layer thickness is 1.6, uh, uh, 1, 1 millimeter 62, uh, which is uh, being formed. And this has been tested for over, actually, a total of 500 parts have been produced. And the tool has been scanned before and after. And the final part has been using the tolerance. So we know the tool is wearing out for sure, but we are still able to have a 96% cost saving from $3,500 for the little tool to $133 for the 3D printed equivalent, which is 912 carbon fiber. We have one of our customers in the UK, John Crane, who has been also investing in the Fortress 450. We actually did a factory tour uh, of the facility a few years ago, and we notified multiple applications. One of the key drivers for them was health and safety, reducing the weight of some of the metal components and the tools uh, for their workers. And we were able actually to find multiple applications, including some soft tools, but also packaging parts that they use for their uh, rings, which are actually heavy duty parts going into the oil and gas and the chemical industry. 
And here you can see that the saving is in uh, 70%. And they were actually very surprised how they could replace some of the metal parts, having additional advantage, especially in terms of the protective uh, aspect of some of the parts. For instance, nylon to a carbon fiber, they were able to clump metal parts with it, but actually it didn't uh, leave any marks onto the component, which was an additional benefit for them. We also see uh, the aerospace industry, for instance, we have a customer who do use protective cover using UTEP 1010, which is a high temperature re uh, resin uh, with a heat deflection temperature of 213 degrees C. So this material can also go into autoclave, for instance. And in this case, what they do, they replace tape, which are used to protect uh, part of the engine when uh, metal is applied back onto uh, the shaft, for instance, to recondition the engine. We also have welding fixtures, and uh, we have really good return on investment, both for the masking tool and the welding fixtures. But what is interesting is we have really interesting materials which work in terms of the heat deflection temperature for the post application. Also, for the electronic industry, you need ESD safe or electrostatic dissipative material. And actually, we have a range of materials who have ESD properties. First of all, the most common is the ABS ESD7 which is widely used. You have also a PEC-based material, the Antero 840 CNO3, which stands for carbon nanotube, which helps basically uh, you know, eliminating the static dis discharge. And finally, we have the nanotrop CF, which also has some level of ESD properties. And here you can see some example of uh, you know, jigs and fixtures for this industry being used. And there's clearly a lot of other advantages compared to sprays or other tape that can be used for ESD because it's in the part, meaning that even the, if the part wear, you don't wear out the ESD properties. Now, looking at today's manufacturing challenge, we see lengthy setup for the machine, variation during assembly and fitting, complicated assembly and parts holding requirements, ease of handling and transportation, defect code to far down production line. Employee safety and ergonomic, we've seen already some examples of that. Cost, time, storage, preventing manufacture from producing needed efficient efficiency tools. And we see also a lot of interest in automation. Actually, automation is one of the fast growing applications within our FDM uh, printer's portfolio. You can see here that machine builders save between 70 and 85% of their profit on each machine from spare part and service. That's very, very important. And here you can see a range of examples of application for automation. Underarm tools, trays, feeders, many, many parts are actually printed. We have actually a customer like Marchesini in Italy, which is a well-known uh, machine manufacturer for automation production line in the cosmetic and pharmaceutical industry. They have multiple Fortus and F370 system, Fortus 450s, F900. And they are actually not only uh, making a few prototypes, they are actually making parts which are used in their product, in their production line, day in and day out, as well as providing all the spare parts. This is a very significant shift in manufacturing technologies towards additive manufacturing. And then, obviously, from automation point of view, uh, we have uh, the Anova, but we can also do anti-static, biocompatible, biocompatible material as well for the pharmaceutical industry. We also have case study which cover that. And also the, the big benefit of the other arm is the weight saving. We have example where on a single tool we save 14 kilograms. And that is being very significant in terms of the wear and the maintenance of the robot as well, which means that you can lower your operating costs or improve your cycle time, which can be sometimes even more important. Here we have an example of a gripper and the pick and place. Uh, which is done by uh, Delco. Uh, and this is a really good example of how they've been able to use vacuum through the part. So you have the suction cups and the, 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 the tool which is actually vacuum, using the, the vacuum through the part and actually the LDM works perfectly and there is no issue with porosity and the vacuum is being held uh, fantastically well. It's also with the use guide to actually guide the products through the line and also trays as well. Here we have another example with uh, Rico. In this case, they need ESD properties, so they use uh, a lot of ABS ESD7, 
nylon to carbon fiber and until due to their static properties for their uh, actually uh, 2D printer uh, manufacturing in Japan. So this is really uh, showing that we have customers worldwide and we are able to support our customers throughout the world as well. Another example, and also coming from John Crane here, is actually uh, the impeller. This was the part which broke down, but the thought, okay, what can we do with additive manufacturing? Instead of just printing the part as it goes, they actually merged multiple parts into a single one. So from 22 components, they were able to print it into a single part and achieve a 98% cost saving. But really, the, the main driver for them was the fact that they couldn't get this part anymore. That was their the bottleneck. So they were able to solve their supply chain issue and print a spare parts and reduce costs at the same time. This is the part we see across industry from oil and gas to the maritime industry where people are using valve handle, which is cold, and actually using U10985, which can be used even on, the, on board a frigate. They are able to actually print those which are fire smoke and toxicity related uh, material. Another example here uh, used in the defense industry is actually a fan which is used mounted directly into an engine. So you need heat detection, you need uh, the mechanical integrity because you are going to rotate at above 3000 RPM and the part is actually working under those conditions. No problem with it because U10985 has a HDT above 150 degrees C and you can achieve a cost reduction of 80% in this case. So, my final slide, just to summarize, Stratasys and technology is already enabling manufacturing to reshore their production. So it's not a wishful dream, it's happening today. While reducing costs and improving competitiveness. FDM is probably the most versatile technology for tuning large parts and and, and this part. SAF H350 is competitive for injection molding. You know, for typically in the tens of thousands of parts, but you've seen an example where we reach for a smaller part, above 200,000 parts. So we can actually go to very, very high level depending on the, the part geometry and the complexity of the injection board. And finally, the 40 to 50 is now fully open with two times more material than it was. That's thanks to the new validity material. That provides a much better return on investment. So thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for questions. <laughs> so maybe a microphone can go around if anybody's got any question, please. Everyone's shy. Shy, yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants uh, the question? All this here? So I take it as a, as a tick. That's good. Actually, we have a question here. And the microphone is coming. So don't worry. Hi, uh, have you got any examples? In clean room environment? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I know we have an uh, example of uh, you know, automation for the pharmaceutical industry. So, yes, we, we have that. Is it clean room? I don't have a case to be uh, in mind to be honest with you. Okay. Can we do it? Um, we actually did some testing on bacteria with the FDM in the past. Uh, we have you know, one of the issues with uh, you know, potential bacteria development on FDM is the paucity of the part. So you can actually have a bacteria which go inside the tube, so if you need a clean room or you know, kind of medical environment, the, the risk is that bacteria will grow on the tube in a non clean environment. So that's a risk. But with other technology like SAF or history, for instance, uh, the part actually uh, seed, so you have less risk of that happening. So this, and by the way, we also see customer in this uh, SAP technology for, um, for grippers and then use parts, uh, where we also are doing some cytotoxicity testing. So I would say I don't have a clear answer, but I'm happy to explore it with you. So we are happy to print a, a sample and, and explore that. No problem. Any more questions? Thank you.